Welcome to the uh, annual Ed Clown Business Luncheon. Hello. I'm Nathan Ritchie. I'm the director of Golden History Museums in beautiful Golden, Colorado. I'm also the chair, outgoing chair, of EdCom. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here with uh, such great uh, colleagues as always here. And uh, we've got a great program for you today, so I promise my remarks will be quick so we can get directly to the program. I said a couple of things I was going to say. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with EdCom, uh, just a, a quick information about EdCom. Um, the organization is part of the professional networks that really advocate for museum education and education professionals through that conduit of the American Alliance of Museums. We do so through a number of different ways, but some specifics are through our awards, our professional, uh, professional awards, the development that we do throughout the year, both at the annual conference and through webinars and through uh, AAM services. We uh, vet sessions that you see here at the annual conference, as well as accept proposals for the marketplace of ideas. We have programming such as the annual luncheon and our evening reception, and we also foster best practices um, through such publications as Excellence's Practice, which you can download for free from our website. We are, as I said, part of the professional network, and what that means is now is anyone who is a member of AAM can actually opt in to EdCom for free. If you are a uh, member of good standing, you can opt into that among any of the professional networks, and I hope that you here have, which by a show of hands, who here has opted into EdCom? Terrific, thank you. I still see hands that are not raised, so I hope that when you return to your home or to your computer, you will opt into that. Um, I also want to take a moment to recognize the board members that we have from um, the from EdCom. If you're a member of the board, could you please stand? I should let you to stand. Identify yourselves as waiters. We've got board members around here. Please stand with them and have you talk with you guys. And I say personally how remarkable it is to work with these professional people. They're inspiring, inspiring to me, and they have so much great information to share. And I hope that you all individuals will consider uh, joining the EdCom board or running at some point too. You can always begin as a volunteer, and we've got numerous different committees. There are committee chairs and there are committees of volunteers to help with our various programs. If you're interested in that, uh, we've got, uh, you can talk to any of your uh, board com, uh, EdCom board members who are sitting with you. I also wanted to acknowledge, I believe we've got two AAM board members. We've got Carlos Tobolero and uh, Joel Hoffman. Are both of those gentlemen here? Ah, uh -huh, there's Joel. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We always appreciate the support of, of, of AAM. And Joel, of course, uh, is an educator in um, a very education sympathetic director, too, at this guy. Um, so last year, EdCom celebrated its 40th anniversary. The organization, uh, the advocacy group, is 40 years old, and we spent a great deal of time reflecting about what that means for the group and what some of the achievements have been and, and where we've, we've come in that time. And in the past year, we've really tried to take a, mo a moment to look at what EdCom can and should be doing preparing for the future. And so we've been uh, really preparing some things that um, I'll be, sh be sharing with you after the session, but I really want to say that we're focusing on what is best, our best practices for museum education, and what's next. What are those cool, innovative things uh, that will be transformational? We're really identifying those, and we're going to be aligning all of those things that I've told you about um, as our, our services to really highlight those, those practices. Um, I wanted to also express deep gratitude both to um, the uh, McCormick Foundation and for the, to the Annenberg Foundation, too, for support of our speaker, uh, Eric Liu, today. And here to introduce our guest speaker, I'm going to now introduce um, uh, Tony Petty from the Reagan Presidential Library at the Annenberg Learning Center. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? Is everyone having a great conference so far? All right, for those of you who, oh, there we go. You can clap. You're having a good conference. Uh, for those of you who don't need, know me, my name is Tony Penny, and I'm the chair elect for professional development here at EdCom. And in my day, night, and sometimes weekend job, I'm uh, the education director at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. Uh, those of you who joined us for the luncheon last year, I just see a show of hands. How many of you were with us for the luncheon last year? Baltimore. Okay, so a number of you. Uh, you were treated to a wonderful conversation that featured Bonnie Pippin, Mary Ellen Munley, 
Linda Sweet and Elaine Gurry and four legends within the field who, on the 40th anniversary of that time, reminded us of a time not so long ago when educators at museums were swirled away in basement offices and tasked with the odious chore of working with children and the general public. People, right? Uh, collections, objects, these were the things that were absolutely at the heart of museum work then. Well, thanks to our speakers last year, and those who have followed in their footsteps, this is no longer the case. Though many of us still have basement offices, <laughs> including myself, uh, the objects themselves are no longer the heart of the museums. Rather, it's the story that these objects tell, and the people who tell them, the educators, the interpreters, the docents, the visitors, and the members of the various communities in which we exist, that breathe life into these objects, and that give them a soul as well as a heartbeat. As a group, last year offered a wonderful opportunity to look critically at the history of our profession and to root ourselves in a collective past, to marvel at all that's been accomplished in the last 40 years. This year, we turned outward to a voice from outside the field with our speaker. EDCOM is an organization, as Nathan just mentioned, uh, is going to focus for the next several years on defining, fostering, and celebrating best practices in museum education, as well as investigating, articulating, and provoking next practices. There's a delightful tension in those two avenues of exploration, uh, between preserving what's best and evolving into what's next. And I think that it's in that tension that we grow as professionals, and we really allow ourselves to accept that. There's also a tension between looking in and seeking outward, Today, after several days of being inspired and challenged by those, uh, your colleagues within the field, I hope you will find it refreshing to hear a voice from beyond. And it's in this spirit that we've invited our speaker today to share his thoughts on the work of museums and the essential role we play in our communities. So in our work as educators, we focus a lot on learning outcomes that are tied to very specific disciplines. The work that I might do at a history institution is going to be far different than what you might encounter at an art institution or a children's museum or a science center. But is there a broader set of educational objectives that we share? What role can and should museums play in fostering the sort of civic learning that supports participation in public life? And how can institutions whose objectives are as diverse as those in this room contribute to a society where all citizens are empowered to tackle the challenges facing our communities? As we reach out to those beyond the walls of our institution, what lessons can we learn from those who work outside of the museums? Here to tackle these questions today is Eric Liu. Eric is a Seattle native, and I want to thank him for ordering up some wonderful sunshine. I've heard that that's not always the case here in Seattle. He's an author, educator, and civic entrepreneur. And he's the founder and CEO of Citizen University, an organization that has a wonderful national portfolio of programs including an annual conference that's held right down the street here in Seattle Center. Uh, I encourage all of you to sign up and to attend next year. Uh, you, have, you may have seen his work in The Atlantic, you know, New York Times, or on CNN. And he's written several books, including The Accident of Asian, The True Patriot, and Gardens of Democracy. And perhaps it's because of the bias of my own role in a presidential library. But I also want to include that Eric served as a speechwriter and advisor to President Bill Clinton. Elaine Murray, one of our speakers from last year, labels institutions like museums, institutions that store, collect, house, and pass along our collective past. She calls these institutions of memory. So perhaps it's fitting that Eric Liu was known for having a knack for composing memorial speeches. In fact, uh, two of you may be familiar with uh, his, he wrote the Requiem for the Victims of the Lockerbie bombing. Uh, and he also proposed President Clinton's uh, 50th anniversary of D-Day speech uh, given at the American Cemetery in Normandy. So please join me in welcoming Eric Williams. Tony, thank you so much for that uh, uh, really great introduction. I, um, I'm really excited to be with you all today. This is really just the the energy that I am feeling from uh, all of you here today, and just as Tony mentioned, the diversity of ways of engagement that each of you represents uh, is really inspiring. And one of the things that I think is just so particularly inspiring is that when we get right down to it, even though every one of you has an impressive title and business card representing very interesting institutions, 
Um, it's all about relationship. Right? This whole conference, the many thousands of you who are here, uh, are here building, forming, strengthening uh, relationships. And this web of relationship and mutual obligation and mutual interest uh, that transcends the fact that your thing might be about wildlife art and your thing might be about presidential history and your thing might be about uh, uh, D-Day or World War II, whatever it may be, um, that there is a greater web, a greater purpose that unites us and that really impels us to form relationships. And I just want to say, as somebody coming in from the outside, um, that it is very palpable to me that this is not just some kind of check-the-box professional networking association, but that the, there are bonds of trust and affection uh, that operate here and uh, that make the work that you're doing all the more powerful. Uh, Tony uh, uh, didn't mention that, uh, that he and I and some of his colleagues uh, at the Reagan Library have gotten over the last couple of years the chance to build bonds of trust and affection and relationship. We've worked together along with the a network of many others, civic innovators and catalysts from all over the country, from different walks of life, from across the political spectrum, people from education, from technology, from Hollywood, from the arts world, from the veterans community, the immigrant rights community, all of whom share in one way or another an interest in revitalizing the idea and the practice of citizenship. And to me, that is, well, to me that is everything. That is my hammer, and everything looks like a nail uh, in relation to the idea of rekindling and revitalizing the idea of citizenship. And it's part of what I wanted to speak about uh, this afternoon. I run this organization called Citizen University, and we're not a four-year baccalaureate uh, traditional university. We really are uh, this people's network of programs, initiatives, uh, and, and endeavors, uh, some of which are unfold in a classroom setting, some of which unfold in a creative environment, and others of which unfold uh, through national media and ideas, uh, all to kind of refocus people on what I think of as the three core components of what it means to be a powerful, engaged citizen. Now, let me just back up before I even unpack those three powerful components and make one thing very clear. When I talk about citizen university, or citizenship, or rekindling the idea of powerful citizens, when I speak of citizenship, I'm not talking at all, or primarily, or, or, or even, even uh, kind of, uh, in any sense, directly about legal status, documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm talking about citizenship in a broader, more capacious sense. The idea of membership in a community, ownership of the fate of that community, and a commitment to participation in the life of that community. I'm talking about, really, the bread and butter of what every single one of you does every single day. The work that you do, not only as uh, museum professionals, but as museum educators in particular. Uh, and this committee, with its long, distinguished history, uh, people who really take seriously the idea that to be a museum educator is to be different uh, in kind, not just in degree, from other kinds of museum professionals and other kinds of educators there's something powerful here, um, is true, and I would say at the heart of it, regardless of where you're coming from, what you're doing is teaching people, young and old, whatever their, whatever their background is, however they come to your institution, you're teaching them how to be citizens. Every museum, every institution of its kind that's represented in this room, whatever its mission statement may be, is a cradle of democracy. It is an arena for the education in the art and the practice and the skills of powerful citizenship. Well, as I say, I think that that practice really does boil down to three very simple components that, again, are woven throughout the work that all of you do. And, and I'll just say a word about each of them. When I talk about citizenship in this sense, I mean values, systems, and skills. There's a values foundation an ethical normative foundation of what it means to be a pro-social, contributing, participating member of a group that's bigger than just you. Now, in my work, I particularly care about the community called the United States, because I do believe that there is something remarkable, indeed exceptional, about the inheritance that each one of us uh, has unwittingly received, uh, and the kind of obligation that each one of us 
uh, therefore carries to sustain that inheritance. But however you define the scope and the breadth of that community, there is a set of norms and values that it's really important to attend to, to unpack and to name. Values like reciprocity, mutuality, and service to others, sharing of sacrifice, but also not only celebrating diversity, but converting diversity into something greater and more lasting than the sum of the parts. These are values that not all people are born feeling or practicing. It falls to us as educators in the broadest sense to draw them out, to inculcate them, to infuse environments with them so that everybody who passes through the institutions that each one of us is connected to in some way gets a new grounding or a recharge in this sense of civic values. The systems piece is what I mean by the idea that, well, basically, the things that make the world go round. Right? And so in a lot of civic education, as it's traditionally understood, people focus on one particular system, which gets shorthanded as how a bill becomes a law. Right? The system of government and the machinery of representative democracy. And that's, a, of course, a foundationally important one. But as everybody here in this room knows, there are many other systems that make our world go around. There are many other systems that yield the objects and the stories that each one of you curates and tries to bring to a wider community. The system of the marketplace. The system of non-governmental organizations, whether they are of faith or family. The system of our actual natural ecosystem, the environment around us, and the ways in which that system shapes our sense of identity and possibility. And to be literate in these systems is as important a part of one's education in democracy as to be literate in words and sounds. To understand how systems work, how power flows through systems, how we get what we get, and why it is that we've gotten what we've gotten. Why it is that we have today this allocation of opportunity and resource. Why it is that we have this particular attitude toward our stewardship of the planet. Why it is that we have this particular set of views and norms about art and humanities and their place in a market-driven society. Each of these things are products of systems, sometimes spoken, sometimes unspoken. Systems not only of ideas, but of practice and power that reinforce the norms and the ideas. And part of our job is to reveal and to make visible those systems. Unless you think this is some high concept notion, I remember one of the opportunities I had when my daughter was in elementary school to go visit her sixth grade class and to talk a little bit about these ideas of citizenship and to talk about values and systems and skills, which I can, I'll get to in a minute. And I just began this conversation with this group of sixth graders asking them, what do you think of as a system? Are there some systems that you could name in your daily life? And hands shot up. And one of the first answers was, yeah, like how the water gets to our water fountain in school. I thought, that's pretty good. That's pretty sophisticated. Recognizing that things don't just appear. That what we encounter in our lives, whether you are 12 and sixth grade or our age, isn't just something that we lucked into having. It wasn't just dumb luck that clean water came out of this thing that got built in the wall here. But that there was a pre-existing system of rules, of norms, of mutuality, of community that brought that water there. Another hand shot up and said, oh, you mean a system like how my favorite cereal ends up at Safeway? I said, yes, another great example of a system in practice. All of us here, in the broadest sense as educators, and all of you who are particularly in the realm of museum education, are in the business of revealing to people, young and old, what had been previously invisible or occluded systems, the ways that things actually work. Which brings me finally to the skills piece of this value system skills uh, triumvirate. And by skills, I simply mean the hard skills of being effective and able uh, in community life. Skills like advocacy, communication, being able to make arguments in public, being able to negotiate among competing views, being able to navigate diversity 
being able, as I said earlier, to convert diversity into something greater. People, once again, are not born knowing how to do these things. These are skills that are developed and cultivated by practice. And there are a few better arenas in every one of our communities for this kind of practice, for this kind of intentional imparting of skills and this intentional opportunity to try out skills than the institutions that all of you represent. I think we are gathered here at a time of tremendous both challenge and opportunity. Um, and when I say we, I use this we in a big sense, not only for those of us who care about education, but again, to kind of fold you into the big we that cares about citizenship. It may not have been in your mission statement, it may not be in the name of your organization, it may not even be kind of top of mind when you think about how you describe your work. But if there's one thing I hope you'll leave today with, it is a renewed appreciation for the ways in which every one of you is an incredibly powerful catalyst, a crucial node of contagion for the ways in which we think about and live as citizens. And the challenge and the opportunity that we have as civic educators in this broadest, most capacious sense are quite entwined. The challenge, of course, that I worry about when I think about how we teach this art of powerful citizenship to people young and old is the same challenge you face, which is how do you get people to care? How do you get people to care? How do you get people, I mean, it's the, and that's prior to how do you get people to show up? <laughs> right? How do you get them to care in the first place and to see the stories embedded in the objects of your institutions and the exhibits that you house as connected to their own stories and their own concerns? And on one level, that's a timeless question of how to get people to care. But on another level, that question has never been harder to answer than right now. Because we have never in this society been as market-driven, commoditized, and marketized as we are today. And those facts are not coincidentally coupled with the fact that we live in a time of nearly unprecedented inequality and concentration of wealth, income, and economic opportunity. You put those two things together, and you have a society where there's tremendous ambient pressure all the time to talk about everything we do, not just in our jobs, but the choices we make to go to this museum or to do something else, to spend this time on Saturday doing X or doing Y. We've, we come under tremendous ambient pressure to justify our actions and our choices and our allocation of time and energy in terms of ROI, in terms of return on investment. We begin to speak a language of the marketplace. We speak about customers. We speak about trying to market to these customers. We speak about trying to slice up their purchasing dollars, grab a little bit of that revenue. And yes, look, I'm not naive. I understand that every organization here, though it may be operated as a not-for-profit, still has to operate as a business and keep doors open and think about some of these things on a practical level. And yet, at the most basic core level of purpose and mission, our mission here as citizenship educators, your mission as museum educators, is not to further amplify and extend the imperialism of the market. It is to actually create a space safe from the valuations and the language and the vocabulary of the market. It's a created realm exempt from those pressures, a realm where we see each other as equal, where we have an equal chance to learn about history, about environment, about art, about science, and where the equality of that opportunity to learn is not shaped or bent or defined by the terms of the marketplace that surround us everywhere else 360 degrees around us. That is our job. That is our challenge right now. How do we get people to care? How do we get people to care when people think of themselves increasingly as time-pressed, money-pressed consumers exhibiting in a hyper-competitive scarcity environment? In that kind of environment, I'll tell you one thing that won't work. One thing that won't work is trying to tell our fellow citizens that museums are just another good market option. That museums are right up there as another form of entertainment to be purchased for $9.99. Because quite frankly, when you stack up museums as entertainment with all the other forms of 
market-driven entertainment that are out there, we don't, we don't stack up that well. That can't be the, the argument that we make. The argument that we make has to be, it is precisely because you feel like you are chasing your tail as a parent, trying to make ends meet, trying to do right by your kids, trying to expose them to certain good things. It is precisely because you are under this kind of market pressure today that you need a space safe from all of that. That you need a space where you can actually remember what it's all about. There have been spaces like that in our country's history. We have called them churches. And those spaces still operate to an extent in that way. And that's great. But what I'm talking about here is not religion or faith traditions. I'm talking about civic religion. I'm talking about treating each one of your institutions as a cathedral to the civic idea of America. As a living museum for the spirit and the idea of democracy. And when you do that, you appeal to people on a level that is not about, hey, we're the brightest, shiniest thing next to the other bright and shiny things. You appeal to people in just the same way that church appeals to some people, in just the same way that silent retreat appeals to some people, in just the same way that meditation appeals to some people, in just the same way that all of us yearn not only to be part of something greater than ourselves, but to have some moments where we can be centered and remember that greater than ourselves means not only in this temporal moment where it's not just about me, it's about us in this room, but also across the generations, greater than our time, that we are connected to a past and that we are inheritors of that past and therefore stewards for a future. The market doesn't let us think that way. Museums do. That is a challenge that we face, but it is, in my view, very much our opportunity as well. I'm a big believer that we are on the cusp of a revival of this, what I call, civic religion. This yearning that people have at the deepest level for purpose that is measured in something not marketized, for a legacy and connection to story, to history, to meaning, to the life of a community that cannot be defined in dollars and cents, and in many ways cannot be defined either by worship of God. That it is about humanism in the same sense that humanities are about revealing the full breadth of the gifts that we bring to one another simply by being, and simply by letting ourselves be our full selves. That humanistic spirit, which is the first casualty of a market mania, is our trust. It is our sacred trust. And so I think about the challenge very much as the opportunity, this opportunity right now to teach democracy in creative ways. And to think about every patron, every kid, every adult, every grandparent, every classroom teacher who walks through the doors of your institution, to think of them as people you are in turn going to infect with the same contagious spirit of civic meaning and purpose. And to recognize that walking through your institutions are people who are not just budding learners and future workers, right? Which is, of course, the language that we use for education these days, both K-12 and certainly higher education, ROI, and how well are they going to be prepared for the workforce. And again, I'm not naive. We live in a time where we're still dazed and shaking ourselves out of the Great Recession where people do have foremost in their minds how they will literally make ends meet. At the same time, walking through your institutions every day are present and future citizen scientists, citizen diplomats, citizen artists, citizen lawyers, citizen caregivers. Some of them may go on actually to be professional artists, scientists, caregivers, and others. But most of them won't. Most of them will do other things. And the question is, will you have, during their brief passage through your institution, imparted something of the spirit to them where they recognize that whatever I end up doing with my life, however far my kind of vocation and future 
lies ahead of me, how can I carry a bit of the spirit of the amateur, of the citizen citizen, who takes it as my responsibility, whatever my title is, whatever my job is, whatever the market says, to carry a little bit of the history and of the identity of this community and carry it on for another generation. I was thinking about, before I came here today, just really trying to get into the head of my, into my own head when I was maybe eight or nine, and thinking about some of the most influential learning experiences I had. And it may, may or may not surprise you, it will probably please you to know that none of those memories that came up were traditional classroom memories. They were memories, I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, in the Hudson Valley, about a 90 minute train ride to New York City. The memories that were super influential for me were my mother taking me on a train ride down to Manhattan and going to see the Cezanne exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And then from there, going and exploring other museums in New York City. It's memories of when I started to get into classical music, of going down to a store that's now defunct and that doesn't exist anymore, also in Midtown Manhattan, right next to Carnegie Hall, called Padelson's. Padelson's was, the, was Earth's best sheet music store, um, back before Amazon. <laughs> and Padelson, though it was a business, uh, was essentially a museum by other means. Because the people who worked at Padelson's knew everything a human could know about the history of classical music. They knew everything a human could know about the social and cultural context of all the music that sat on the shelves there. And those trips I took down to New York and to Padelson's when I was nine and 10 formed me in my sense, not only for a love of music, but formed me in my sense that music is connected to something else. Music is connected to history. Music is connected to economics. Music, music is connected to culture. Music is connected to war and to peace and to all of these things. And I learned that from just the conversations that were washing over me as I stood in the shelves for hours at a time in Palesons. I think fast forward ahead. Tony mentioned that one of the speeches I had the great honor to work on for President Clinton was almost exactly 20 years ago for the 50th anniversary of the Allied invasion of Normandy, D-Day. Uh, as it happens in a couple of weeks, I and a good friend of that from that time, a fellow speechwriter and our spouses, will be heading back to Normandy uh, for the 70th anniversary. And uh, what Tony did mention as well, um, that he works for the Reagan Library, that you know when I worked for President Clinton and we were preparing for this 50th anniversary, we were quite conscious of the tour de force that President Reagan had delivered at the 40th anniversary. And the great speeches that Peggy Noonan had written um, for his appearance then. And I'll never forget the time that I spent in the weeks and months leading up to the writing of those speeches, which were essentially museum by other means. Where, because we were at the White House, we could kind of pick up the phone and ask anybody anything. And so we would call Stephen Ambrose, the great historian, and ask him questions as he had been finishing up his own book on D-Day. We would talk to veterans of the Allied invasion. We would read their letters. We would go through archive materials of battle plans and strategy, but also of individual fears and hopes on the eve of that great consequential pivot point of history. And I think back to the work that I was doing as a speechwriter, and I think about who it was who helped us. And it was, again, there were institutions that were, in fact, formal museums, whether they were part of the Smithsonian or World War II museums and other things like that. But just as much, it was people who had a passion as citizen educators, as veterans, as people who were close to the veterans, who had a passion for making sure that a story survived and that a story was told in its fullest multidimensional sense. Those people who I encountered in the course of working on those speeches shaped me as much as anybody I've ever took, taken a class from, worked with, or learned from. Some of them were, like you, professional museum educators. Many of them were basically the kinds of people who are coming through your institutions every day and who you want to make sure you plant the seed into and embed this idea and this spirit into. 
I want to close just by offering one final thought about what it is that we're doing together here. You know, I started out by just kind of appreciating the energy that I feel in a room like this in a way that all of you have this sense of collegial common cause across the very kind of incredible diversity of actual subject matter that you all work on in your daily lives. And I think it's super important to name and to explicitly foster the spirit of fellowship. You all are in my town, and I'm so glad that you're in my town, and our town has shown you nice weather, and you know, and you'll come back to Seattle and you know, uh, and, and enjoy it here. But in a day or two or three, whatever it is, you're going to leave. You will disperse. You'll go back to your day, night, weekend jobs, as Tony put it. You'll be back in your institutions. You'll be back to worrying about the budgets and the office politics and the this and the that, and you'll be back in your a narrow gauge view of life, which is just life. And the thing that I hope, sincerely, you will carry into your first day back at work after you leave Seattle is just a little bit of the spirit that's in the room right now. This sense that we are connected in a deeper way, and it's not just because you have professional skills and professional aptitudes and professional credentials, that we are connected in a deeper sense of purpose. And that this fellowship of purpose is something we have to take great pains to nurture and to sustain. And to think about, I've talked several times now about museum by other means. I think in the civic religious sense, a room like this right now for us, for the balance of this hour, is our own little civic church by different means. And we have to, when we finish up lunch here, look each other in the eye, shake each other's hands, acknowledge one another, see one another, feel one another, and commit to one another that we're going to keep this idea that to be a museum educator is to be a teacher of democracy. To be engaged in this work is to revitalize and to revive citizenship. And to practice what you practice is not only to practice the profession of museum educator, it is to practice the identity and the idea of being American. If we do that for each other, this lunch will be a success far beyond anything that I could say or name, and far beyond anything that this conference uh, in its short time here in Seattle uh, could impart. So thank you very much for being with us here today. And I think Tony and I are gonna now have just a bit of conversation on stage and then open it up to a wider uh, room-wide conversation. Thank you very much. So this book um, that I wrote uh, with my colleague and friend Nick Hanauer called The Gardens of Democracy, the title itself contains an argument. It's, it's, a bit of, it's connected to the argument that I was making here about pushing against market imperialism. The idea is this, that the metaphor that we so often use in American life to describe our economy, to describe our government, to describe our community life is the metaphor of a machine. Right? If you just stop and think about it, 
Pick any day's business section headlines about the economy. Economy firing all cylinders, economy stalling, you know, fed to tap the brakes, to you know, guard against inflation, all of this mechanistic language and metaphor that we use to talk about the economy as if the economy were some magical, perfectly efficient, self-perpetuating uh, machine. We talk the same way about government. I mean, even the language, uh, you know, God bless James Madison in the Federalist Papers, but the language of checks and balances is itself the language of machines. Language that assumes that to govern oneself, even the language of regulation, the word regulation is machine language. We have this metaphor of machine in our minds all the time, and though there's something useful in that metaphor, and somewhat kind of explanatory, uh, it blinds us, it limits us profoundly. Uh, it makes us think of ourselves as atomistic, isolated units, as inputs. It, it feeds this kind of market identity and market language. And what my argument is that's contained in the very title of this book is the right metaphor for what we are, for who we are and what we are together is not the machine, it's the garden. The garden is a complex adaptive system just like a neighborhood, just like a city, just like a country, just like a society, just like an earth. A complex adaptive system. And complex adaptive systems, say at the scale of a garden, don't just run themselves the way you might think a machine can just run itself. Right? They require the weeding and the seeding and the feeding and the tending that I described there. And so if you apply that thinking to economics, you can see how that makes you think about Economics says the work of tending a garden, because as you know, anybody who's spent 10 minutes gardening knows that if you are laissez-faire about your garden, <laughs> right, it will grow like gangbusters for a while. And then after that while ends, noxious weeds will take over, choke off the growth in that garden, and the garden will tip over and die. That is a result of a laissez-faire gardening philosophy, right? Same is true of a laissez-faire economic philosophy and a laissez-faire civic philosophy. Just letting things be in a complex adaptive system is basically saying, I'm okay with things clumping, concentrating, choking off, and dying. Right? Uh, and so, to return it to the work we're doing, I mean, my goodness, I'm not sure there are better gardeners of our democracy than museum educators. Because, you know, your institutions are not the compulsory institutions of public education. Your institutions are institutions of choice, of ascription, right? Of affinity, of at least people being open to the serendipity of, I'm gonna walk past this, what is this place? Tony was telling me about a place, I forget what city it is, but a museum of broken relationships, you know? Uh, <laughs> What is this place? I'm going to go in here, right? Um, your work as museum educators is this work of tending the garden of democracy. It is inviting people in to see a particular slice of how this garden got tended before and how, therefore, we today might try to tend it, right? But even the invitation in in the first place is an invitation to try your hand at gardening, right? Uh, and so I think that kind of metaphor, um, you know, it's a little biblical, it's a little poetic. And by the way, I, for all my Bible talk and civic religion talk, I, I'm not a person of, I was not raised in any particular religion uh, or, or faith tradition. Uh, and maybe actually precisely because of that, I'm so, uh, you know, uh, invested in the idea of civic religion. Uh, but I think for all of you, whatever your realm may be, the idea of thinking yourself as a gardener and thinking about the plot that you have in your neighborhood, community, however you define community, and what it means to tend to that garden, and distinguishing between weeding and seeding um, is, I think, helpful. Excellent. Well, now I want to turn to our many gardeners in the audience uh, and see if anybody has a question or a comment or a reaction to all the things that uh, Eric has been saying here. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. We have a microphone that will come around. Are there any questions? Hi, the concept 
concept of civil religion or civic religion was very common in the 1970s. But well, that concept sort of broke apart and, and was fragmented when it was discovered that Americans didn't share that many common symbols. Do you think that fabric has been knit back together? And what are those symbols now? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it's interesting. If you, if you track these multi-year, multi-decade opinion surveys, um, there are certain aspects of our common identity as Americans that have endured through times of centrif centrifugal you know, social upheaval, times of great recession and economic pressure. Um, and some of that has to do with a creed, a set of ideas that you can find embodied in you know, what I think of as great civic texts, um, whether it's Gettysburg or the preamble to the Constitution or the Declaration or the I Have a Dream speech. Um, there are kind of iconic words and ideas that people associate with this nation and its um, and its civic religion. That's that's one thing. Uh, and I think you know the fact is that even today, uh, this period of incredible cynicism about politics, uh, that politicians uh, as, and citizens alike still feel it necessary to justify their choices and their actions by invoking one part or another of this creed. We've not yet gotten to the point where we justify, where public figures or active citizens justify their preferences by saying simply, it's what I want and it's good for me. Though that may in fact be the case. They justify it in terms of, this is in the spirit of the American idea of opportunity for all. Or this is in the spirit of the American idea of liberty and throwing off the yoke of intrusive government. Right? That we continually evoke and invoke language from civic scripture. I mean, as it is with scripture itself, with religious scripture, you know, uh, invocations are subject to great abuse. They can be, that language can be appropriated for many purposes. But that is no reason for me to therefore stop reading, knowing, or using the language. Uh, it is only kind of a call, therefore, for us to get that much more able and sophisticated about how others are using the language. So the language is one piece. Um, <clears throat> I think there's another piece that is very interesting right now. I, I'm, I'm an optimist by nature, and, and, and um, you know, and I look at where we are as a country, and you think, if I were a pessimist, I could say there are many reasons to worry about you know, what people have been uh, worrying about in public for 20, 30 years, which is the you know, disuniting of America, as Arthur Schlesinger put it, right? Fragmentation. Uh, of America, that instead of a culture, we now have multiculturalism and everything's flown apart. I, I just dispute the premise of that very narrative. I see that not as reversion or breakdown or disintegration. I see that as a certain kind of progress properly understood. Because the monoculture that we used to have, apart from the language of the creed, what used to, what used to dominate here, what we used to mean when we said Americanization, right? 50, 70, 80, 100 years ago, when we talked about Americanizing immigrants, what we meant was waspifying them. What we meant was whiteifying them, right? And to me, it is progress, not regression, that we no longer have to waspify in order to claim this country. And I'm not just talking about, I mean, you know, even white immigrants from Southern Europe at the turn of the last century felt they, they were, you know, of a practically different race because they were not wasp enough, not Yankee enough, right? Um, and I think that notion of Americanization is one I'm very happy to leave behind. That notion of monoculture and unification, I'm very happy to transcend. What we've had really since the 70s, through the 80s, and through what people call the culture wars, and I'm sure some of your institutions have been sometimes willing and sometimes unwilling, kind of, you know, willingly caught in the crossfire of those culture wars, um, has been a period where we have complexified that story, where we have begun to recognize in full public view the full actual diversity of our actual public square, right? And if you want to think about it in kind of philosophical Hegelian terms, there's thesis 
there's antithesis, and then there's synthesis, right? The thesis of America was, this is a white Christian nation by God, right? The antithesis that we have seen since the civil rights movement, since the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, is this is a multicultural complex country with far more stories and far many more voices than ever were heard in the official histories, and that it's time to excavate those and amplify those, right? But if all we, and that's, that is progress, but if all we do is stop there, then I think we will have missed, not only a moment, but we will have missed the point of this country. We now have to go from that antithesis to a new synthesis. How now do we, in a way that fully acknowledges, respects, is excited about the full breadth of human diversity that is embodied in this country, how now then do we make that unum out of our pluribus? I'm super excited about that. That's our opportunity right now. It's never been done in the history of the planet to have a mass multicultural republic. You've had small multicultural republics, you've had mass monocultural republics, you've never had a mass multicultural republic where people of all different backgrounds actually have an idea, this crazy idea that they have an equal voice and an equal shot at running things and an equal say in how things should be decided. It's by far, I mean, it, you know, how the story is going to end is quite unclear. And like I say, if I were a pessimist, I would tell you lots of reasons why this story is going to end kind of like Rome's story of a mass multicultural republic ended, right? An empire and collapse. <clears throat> but I think our system is inherently more adaptive and more resilient and more capable of self-renewal than Rome's, or for that matter, if you want to think in contemporary terms about the shadow that's looming across our society, than China. I'm Chinese-American, and I know well the greatness of Chinese civilization, and I believe precisely because of what I know that even when it comes, when the day comes, and it may come this year when China's GDP surpasses that of the United States, this country will remain not only indispensable, but in some ways dominant. For a reason that I actually lay out in this, uh, I've got a new book coming out this summer called A China and Its Chance, about this idea of being Chinese American in this moment of China and America. And the reason why I think we remain indispensable and exceptional is I boil it down this way. America makes Chinese Americans. But China does not make American Chinese. It's that simple. China doesn't want to. They're not even remotely interested in taking people from other places, even taking people who are co-ethnics like me from another place and, and integrating us and making them Chinese in some sense. It's just, it's literally a foreign concept. That's not a foreign concept here. That is the point of here, right? And those of us who are blessed, and we are blessed to have, a, to get, to have our, day, our day jobs be to, to engage people, to teach people, to connect people to paths and histories that either they used to claim or never thought about claiming. Like, we are on the cutting edge of this experiment. Um, and I, I think um, the fact that it's not yet clear what the unifying, the, the new synthesis is going to be, um, that's not.